Watch all the way to the end. Got some news about uh, free giveaways. Uh, so you gotta watch the end to hear what you gotta do to make sure that we can start giving this stuff away. Gonna have a lot of cool comics and some other stuff gonna be given away on the show. So stay tuned. In 2005, I opened the store. I go to my first retailer summit and I'm like, these, these clowns control our entire destiny. I mean, literally. It took me all of, I believe that was a September retailer summit. So that's nine. And I opened in March. It took me six months to realize diamond is not the clowns that need to be controlling this exactly. industry. The retailers need to start wagging the dog. And, and, and I actually have talked to a lot of people. They're like, I, I remember, I remember the questions you were asking at that first retailer summit. And I knew you were going to be trouble from that point forward. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, because guess what? I'm in now. I'm invested. I've got I'm my kids dealing with this. I am not going to allow you guys to run my shit into the ground because you can't figure out what you're doing. I am not a diamond catalog store. Right. You know, my store is going to be my store no matter what you guys think. And I mean, and you remember 2005, how many experts told you and how many you what year did you open your store well 2014 i came in late i'm only seven years oh. old now oh okay so 2005 let me tell let me give you the landscape here i'm buying greenland and rebirth infinite crisis comes out that year civil war comes out that year we got some of the best storylines are coming out from scratch from start right you got the ultimates is in full bloom and I had the experts tell me, why are you still doing these floppies, man? You need to turn your entire store into a trade paperback mecca. Because that's like, where they really make their money. That's where they make their money, not where we make our money. Exactly. And guess what? First time, do you remember, did you did you know Dave Hawksworth? Uh, it's familiar. Who, who, a diamond who? outside sales guy. Older guy passed away around 2017. I think I've spoke to him, but I don't remember him that well. Well, Dave would come into town and he would drag the suitcase in around 2008, 2009. He did the first visit to my store and he drags his suitcase in and I was young and cocky and I had my little laptop out and with my <laughs> little scan gun. And uh, he's like, oh, here's a really good, I'm, I'm not going to throw any books under the, under the bus. Hey, here's a really good book. It sells really well. Uh, well, how much does it cost? Uh, it's $15 wholesale, $30 retail. Scan gun, Amazon. Yeah, I can get this book for 10 bucks on Amazon right now. Yep. And I did that to his entire briefcase of books that the publishers paid him to drag around, which inevitably I think uh, cost him, you know, his life because he just he ate, ate shitty on the road. Right. And smoked and, and he's, you know, hauling this suitcase around it's not good exercise and and I, I i'm like look dave come out he's after about two visits he, he basically was like hey i just come to hear what you're gonna have to say this year dennis because <laughs> I, I really learned more from you than i learned from any of the other people around here when i first opened our library said hey why do why should i buy my trade paperbacks from your local business we'll buy them from you here's all the prices on amazon you buy them and we'll buy them at that amazon price i'm like i can't buy them at the amazon price I know. And I remember, do you remember when Walking Dead went from a $14.99 volume one to 1999 volume one? Yep. And our cost was going to be $9.99 plus shipping. Right. I can still buy the goddamn book for $8.99 on Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. Why would I pay you a dollar more and shipping when Prime is going to mail it to me within three days? Right. Right. And I, I there was a period of time where I ordered probably 50% of my back stock for trade paperbacks on Amazon. Yep. So, so luckily I have had the, the cojones enough to tell everybody in the industry, go fuck off. <laughs> I'm going to follow my own road. My, my own road got me here. I'm going to follow my ro own road out of here. And, you know, and of course I, I'm, I'm very infamous or famous in a lot of circles, especially on, on this channel for being the guy that dropped the box of damaged comics on the stage in Baltimore uh, 
at the Diamond Retailer Summit. Yeah. And I, I, I saved it up every year for Diamond Retailer Summit. I, ha- I was going to have something. You know, I wanted to talk about something. There was going to be a conversation that was going to be had, and it wasn't going to be pushed off to next year or the year after, or, you know, an email later. And that was the year I, I, I had it. And that yeah. was the year that all the retailers like were like, okay, you know what? This crazy motherfucker, Dennis, uh, <laughs> he's on to something. Because, you know, and my whole point was, Diamond has been using the same box since 1994. Yeah. The average comic book cost a dollar. And every comic book in that box cost the retailer 50 cents. Yep. So a Diamond 400 count cost $200 for the entire box. Right. Now, economy of scale, sure. But when that same box has $4 comic books in it at $2 a piece, yeah, and eight bills. that box is an $800 box, you need to have a little bit more protection around it. Right. Did I even do the math right on that one? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 So I'm like, the, you, you're putting four times the value into the same box and you're not protecting it. And I suggested <coughs> reinforced uh, triangular wedges, you know, the, right. on each corner. Then they'd have to and totally they, change the size of the box. Right. And they, I'm, I'm like, and then they were, oh, we have the new and improved box. Remember this one's going to do. And I, I literally tested that out on a YouTube video and, and put it on Facebook and tested it out, put it on a YouTube video. And it didn't do anything better. Other than the bottom, the bottom being solid. That's it. That's the only real bone in well, you know what it actually did? The flaps, I don't know. You probably reuse diamond boxes as much as I do. Oh, yeah. I used to be able to fold the flaps in. Now they're a little bit longer and you can't, you have to cut them to fold them in to make them as like a little catch box. Right. They actually made the box worse for my use. <laughs> So, all right, so so let's let's hear what... Well, let me look. I got one more twist and turn. So my frustration oh, okay. with Diamond led me to, A, I, I wanted to buy my own building, which if you're a young retailer or you think you want to That's the way to go. Let me tell you the one lesson I wished I'd learned 15 years earlier. Buy, buy a, a building. building. And yeah. what you said, Emmett, it's a destination. You know what? It is. It, they don't have to have you next to the the, the dry cleaner shop or nope. next to a restaurant. They will find you, and they will find you if you have a shitty building on the outskirts of town. They will find you if you have a shitty building on the middle of town. You just have to own your own business. You have to yep. own your own building. Yeah. You will, you will be a hundred times happier. Yes. <laughs> Although I have a great deal and a great landlord, but... I would still rather have my own building. I would still rather have my own building for sure. Sure. I got the option to buy my own building and I did it, which was going to, I was going to leave a, a little bit of a, a presence in my old location because it was 30 miles from here. And I was like, you know what? I'll, I'll leave a little presence. I'll keep my bold customers happy. And then because the, the move took way longer and I had a healthy, unhealthy uh, lifestyle, uh, I literally had a massive heart attack two months after finishing the move into our new oh. building and my family and had a double bypass surgery. And I was like, shut down the stores. We're not going to do anything. We'll still buy new comics for collectible purposes and, you know, to sell. Right. So there was a lot of stuff that I knew was going to be making money, but we're not going to do the poll service anymore. We're not going to. And then. Because Diamond just kept kicking the boxes. I make the joke because Diamond just seems like they were kicking the boxes. Um, it, it, not protecting it from UPS kicking it is the same as you kicking it yourself. Uh, I said in 2019, after the 2019 Retailer Summit, where I was summarily barred from all 2020 Diamond events for making too many problems, I... Uh, <laughs> I said, I'm not buying new. I have no confidence in Diamond anymore. I'm not buying any new comic books from this point forward. I'm done with Diamond. Uh, And then, of course, COVID happened. Uh, One thing after another, uh, there were no 2020 Diamond events. So my punishment went completely uh, unfazed. Um, I made sure Diamond understood that I, uh, I, I, I 
I, I took my penalty uh, very, very seriously. Yeah, it's a badge of honor, man. <laughs> yeah. So, and then I said, you know what? Okay, I'm going to rethink this now. Because I know what COVID was going to do to this industry. I knew what COVID was going to do to retail real early on. I did a lot of uh, my little Facebook live videos during that time. Right. And I talked to a lot of people and I knew that everything was changing. And I said this in a lot of my videos. When this thing comes out, you have one chance to change everything because there's no rules. Right. right. You're going to, and I put my money where my mouth is. And that's when I opened my new store. All right, so let let us uh, hear all about the new store and your your business model for the new store. So the business model from the new store, I, for lack of a better word, the city of Monroe did not have a comic book store for 15 years, and in my opinion, it didn't have a really good new comic store then. So right. for over 20 years. It was just kind of like, hey, we also sell comic books, but here's the uh, magic cards and here's the sports cards and here. Okay, they're a collectible store. I know that. I understand that. Um, and there's a business model that you kind of understand what that goes with that. But 15 years have gone by. The, nobody read anything for the last 15 years in this town unless they were going to a store 30 miles north in Detroit or 30 miles south in Toledo. Right. So I said, oh, there's the cat. <laughs> um, so I said, okay, what can this store be? And then I had my 50th birthday party in December. And I rented out a movie theater. I rented out a little breakout room in the mall so we could have catered food. And I invited like 50 of my good friends. Oh, that's uh, cool. And, and I said, let's go see Spider-Man together for my 50th birthday. <clears throat> and then I'm walking through the mall and I'm like, where are all these people coming from? They all came to see Spider-Man and they all started walking around the mall. Yeah. And there was like a little resale shop here. And there was the Salvation Army clearance center where, you know, all the donations get uh, sent. There's still a Spencer's. Uh, there's, you know, there's an, a video. There's two arcades in this one claw arcade and won just pinball games. And I'm like, okay, there's something going on in this mall. And so I did a little research and actually the guy who has the claw machine game has like a million YouTube subscribers that just oh, watch him. Yeah, just watching him empty out his he, uh, it's claw kicker. I'll give him a <laughs> shout out. And I'm like, okay, if this guy is doing that kind of business and I'm watching him take like stacks of money out of this claw machine at the mall. And I'm like, okay, there is some something going on in this mall. So I said, what am I going to open? I don't want to buy new comics. I don't want to go back on that. And I don't think anybody's learned a lesson yet. Right. You know, DC's still putting out the same crap. Marvel, I think, puts out better crap, but they put out 100 variant copies of each one of those crap. Um, I don't think Image has anything right now. I mean... They've got a couple flash in the pans, but they don't have Walking Dead. They don't have Invincible. No, King Spawn's doing really well. King Spawn and Scorched are doing really well. They're in, they're in the 70,000. That's a, the number now today. The number today now is 75,000, 70, 75,000. That's like the top, that's a top book. That's a top 10 yeah. book. And then split that between 2,000 comic stores or 1,500, right. depending on who you listen to. Right. Um, so, so yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, well, I don't want to get into that game. But guess what? I have tons of these boxes of shitty comic books that I don't put on Amazon. And I I hate dragging around to shows to let uh, speculators dig through them at a dollar a piece to find a $10 book. Um, right. And then they, I still drag, I, you know, I, I drag 250 comics in a box so that speculator can buy one of them for a dollar. And then I got to drag 249 back home. Uh, or I have to dump it to another dealer for 30 or 40 bucks a lot, depending on what they're paying that week. Right. So I'm like, okay, what do you do with that? Well, I think 80s and 90s comics have some of the most dynamic covers that you've ever seen, but they're all boxed up in white boxes in the back of your store. Right. 
So I said, what if I put them on the wall of the store? What if I treat it? Now, hold on. I'm going to tell you I'm cheating because I actually saw a store do this back in 2006. And I went to the comic shop. I did the same thing you said. Destination. I went to the comic book section of the Yellow Pages and I saw a comic book store. I went to it and I'm like, there's no new books here. What the hell is this guy doing? (laughs) And they just had Spider-Man books on the wall at cover price. And they just had Batman books on the wall. I'm like, I didn't get it. Most of their shit was video gaming. They had people playing Xbox and and computer games. But they had comic books. And they were still a comic book store because guess what? Comic books is the umbrella. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And they got me. But they they wanted to do video games with their comic book store. So I, I, I always had that in the back of my head that this, you could have a comic book store without new comics. And then I gave a speech four years ago about how comic retailing can survive whatever comes next. And I think next is going to happen. Next is a little bit of COVID and a little bit of a whole lot of other factors. And I, I explained what I call the life of the hippie record store. Now, you yeah. look like you might have been to a couple hippie record stores in your day. Oh, yeah. I used to do I used to do vinyl. I, yeah, I used to be a hippie record store with the comics and everything else. Exactly. So what what and I'll try to make this real quick. I know I don't know what your time limit is, but we'll make it into two parts, three parts. It doesn't matter. I love talking comics. I'll talk for for days. Store started in the fifties and sixties. Yeah. Okay. Well, the at the exact same time. Regional record stores started popping up. Here in Detroit, there was a place called Corvettes. Tower Records popped up. You know, every little place started having all of these little regional record stores. Sam Goody, all this kind of stuff. And little by little, the hippie record stores started shrinking. But what did they sell as they started shrinking? Everything. T-shirts, posters, blacklight. <laughs> Just everything. Tobacco pipes, pipes, yeah, yeah, incense burners, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, they start. They figured out everything they could sell in their wheelhouse to stay alive, and then, <laughs> and then, bigger entities came in. Walmart, Kmart, you got uh, Virgin Records, you got Tower Records moves across the entire world, and the hippie record store was still there. I remember there were the little hippie record store. There was a period where they didn't sell records. No, it was a head shop. Everything but records. But it was yeah. the same damn store that was selling records 20 years ago. Right. But then right. guess what happens? Sam Goody's gone. Virgin's gone. Tower Records. All things must pass. If you've never watched that documentary, you need to watch that documentary. It's the greatest documentary ever. I'll have to look that one up. It, it definitely has a parallel to comic book stores. They're all gone. Best Buy has like one rack in their store. FYE is gone. Uh, Suncoast Records is gone. They're all gone. But the hippie record store was still there. And then this guy named Jack White came out of the shadows of Detroit. Yeah. And he told all of his minions, hey guys, why don't you go find a record store and I'll let you buy this exclusive album on record store day. And then guess what? People started buying vinyl again. Vinyl again, yeah. And the hippie record store went from having 20 records to having thousands of records again. Yep. I went into a record store on a Monday and there was 20 kids, my kid's age, dropping a hundred bucks a piece. And the guy was like, oh yeah, it's usually busy like this on a Monday. And that's when I came up with the whole, the hippie record store, is and can be the comic book shop. Absolutely. We have, to figure out, we have to figure out what we sell in between the day DC announces there's no new comics. <laughs> the day Marvel says, oh good, we don't have to make comic books anymore because our competitor DC has given up on it. The day Image Comics is like, we're 100% digital now, guys. Go to image.com to download all your comics. Hey, but what about those 1,500 comic book stores? that have relied on you to put their kids through college and right, right. feed their families. Uh, good luck, guys. <laughs> I mean, honestly, 
if yeah. do you think the response would be anything other than good luck guys because guess what march of 2020 the only solutions they had was hey we'll give you discounts if you want to buy all the shit in our warehouse that we can't get rid of because there's a COVID thing going on yeah well that they they they've completely left us new dealers out in the cold like they don't talk to us there's been no uh retail i guess there's going to be a retailer thing at new york maybe this i mean i haven't gotten i'm going to have a lunch i'm just going to have a lunch in san diego yeah i heard they have, have it in san diego i wonder if they're going to have one in new york because we used I to have breakfast we used to have breakfast in new york and yeah. um you used to be able to see like all the publishers were there but it looks like most of them aren't there anymore. It's going to be Boom, Aftershock, and uh, Marvel, maybe. You know, and I and I love Ross Ritchie and Boom, and I love Aftershock, uh, Joe Pruitt, and I love uh, Travis over at, uh, uh, oh, I can't believe I just blanked on his uh, publisher's name. Good boy. Um, oh. What? What? I said, OK. Yeah. So, you know, I, I love all these guys but there's nothing they can do to drive customers into our store anymore. I just don't believe that. I love their products. I love the enthusiasm they have. Uh, but, oh, SourcePoint, I just I just remembered it. Yeah. SourcePoint Press. But I love the enthusiasm, but guys, it's gotta go from the top. And if Marvel and DC can't put the asses in our seats, your books aren't gonna do it either. I, I remember, and you've been to retailer summits before. Do you remember when Nikki Barucci would get up and talk for 15 fucking minutes at a retailer yeah. summit. And I'm like, Nikki, you represent 0.1% of this fucking industry. <laughs> if you doubled your fucking number, that means I sell one more book. <laughs> your 15 minutes is a waste of my time. And then yeah. Valiant would get up there and talk for 30 minutes. And I'm like, uh, this is a smoke break time. Bye. This is the, Valiant is the one thing that has me completely perplexed in comic books. They get some of the best writers, some of the best artists. It's great content and nobody buys it. That, that Jeff Lemire bloodshot run, amazing. The art, amazing. Nobody bought it, nobody bought it. Yeah. I have plenty of it in my back bins. If anybody wants, you can hit me up <laughs> at cover price. I, it's just a matter of, at a certain point, and I, I had this conversation with, I, I, with uh, Chuck Rosansky actually. Oh, okay. Chuck Rosansky and I were talking and he was like, you you haven't realized, he, he told me what, what was an epiphany. You haven't realized the game is not to come up with a great idea to sell to customers at the publishers. The entire purpose of the publisher is to sell to you, right. the retailer. Right, 100%. And once they've sold us, Two months later, we got to take it, right. whether they did their job or not. And it, and they think that having the intern tweet out, hey, new book drops this week, go check out your local comic book store. Hey, there we go. Hey, why didn't your book sell? We, we tweeted about it. But they, they don't even have enough, they don't even have enough followers to push a book. How many thumbs up our tweet got? Yeah, but still it's not that big of a number. I know, that's the point. All they do is they sell us. Right, they should be, ha the, the people tweeting, the people tweeting should be, have a million followers, not 40,000. And I said that in a, I said that on a Facebook video. Where is, and I don't know who these people are. Uh, I don't know, but where is Marvel going to Mr. Beast? Yeah, you know who Mr. Beast yeah. Is? Him, him I know from YouTube, yeah. Marvel could go to Mr. Beast tomorrow and go, Mr. Beast, how much money would it take for you to make a Mr. Beast comic book here at Marvel? Yep. And you know what? We'd have 20 million Mr. Beast fans invading Batman, our fucking stores. The Batman you know? Fortnite comic sold, I had people that I'd never seen before in my shop come in to buy that Batman Fortnite comic. And then it was over. A huge influx of new customers was when uh, that weekend Starboy from Marvel. Yeah. To me, that was some out of the box thinking, and I sold that book amazingly well. Yeah. And and but the point is, is the follow up is there, you know? And I I, I jokingly say, 
you know, look at the guys from Red Letter Media. They're all fucking comic book geeks. Rich Evans, yeah. I guarantee you, Rich Evans could come up with a better idea for a Star Trek comic for IDW or whoever has Star Trek right now. Yeah. Whoever's got the license, hire Rich Evans to write a Star Trek. And when he talks about it on his thing, there's a million people that are going to go looking for that comic book. Uh, one of the best, uh, and it was a podcast. Remember Sheriff of Babylon? Oh, yeah. Uh, or was it like Mars something? It was like Mars. I don't. I forget what it was. Uh, not Sheriff of Babylon. No, it was, it was uh, what's her name? Mars. Something of Mars. Her. Yeah, it was the, was the young girl show. Yeah. Like Evan Dunn and Evan Run. Or, I can't remember. It, maybe your people uh, will know what it is. But I bought this book and I put it on the wall just on pure speculation that Image knew what they were doing. We sold that book. We didn't sell any in store. I threw them on Amazon and they started selling all over the world for like yeah. $20 a piece. And then I'm like, who the fuck are these guys? And why aren't they making more comic books? Because if I can sell these things for 20 bucks a piece to their obscure fans, and it turns out they were just two podcasters that talked about comics that decided to come up with an idea and Image let them do it. And yeah. it probably didn't sell Dick Dollar One at Image. So they probably never had them come back. They didn't realize that's an investment in the future. Image doesn't care how many you sell because they it, their money also gets from the trade paperbacks. They get they get 40% of the trade paperback sales where they don't really get, other than the paying for the printing, and then of course there's a fee for uh, their administration of the book coming out. Uh, once that's paid, the creator gets everything until the trade comes out and then it's a 60-40 split on the trade. And depending on the, they may have different contracts for different uh, you know, people, but. So, so to make a longer story short here at the end, I wanted to get out of being under the thumb of this industry. I wanted to also show that what we have done in the past is almost as more important, if not more important than, and then guess what? Guess what happened? The facsimile boom. The yeah. facsimile boom. Emmett. We're, I know retailers that have made more money off of facsimiles and dollar uh, reprint books than they do off the new books from these publishers. I, I have not sold 10 issues, single issues of any Marvel or DC book until the facsimiles came out. And then I'm selling tens, 15s of, of them, right? Oh, yeah. uh, Batman, I used to sell 12, 15 issues of. I don't sell more than two. Spider-Man, no more than four. Like this, I'm a small market co comic shop. If I can't sell five books of yours, you're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I brought those numbers up all the time at retailer summits and they laughed at me. What? I'm like, dude, I sold two during pre new 52. I was selling 225 of three different Green Lantern comic books that I was reading and putting my customers onto. Yes, right. I was I was putting my thumb on the scale, but I was selling 225. <laughs> they reboot that thing, and then they come out with four titles, and I couldn't sell 75 of four titles a after six months. Yeah, that's not my fault. Right, that's not my fault. That's DC's fault. Well, you know, you know Lunar now Lunar's had it long enough. Now we've gone through. Uh, we're on our second cycle. And I missed my number by $80, right? So I went from 50% down to 35%. And I have to pay shipping for Lunar. And if you don't buy 20, if you don't buy $125 worth of comics, they won't ship them to you, even though you're paying for shipping. <laughs> so I, I am on the fence about, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's sad because I'm a DC fanboy. I'm a DC fanboy. I'm the I'm their guy, man. From when I was a kid, Swamp Thing, Sergeant Rock, Batman. Watch it, damn it. Just do what they really want. This is and I said this in June or May or June of 2020. This is all a scam to make retailers give the money to the new books to discount comic book service. This is the number one threat to comic retailers. Yeah. You, you cannot tell me, Emmett, that discount comic book service doesn't know that the Detroit area is buying 
500 Batmans a month. Exactly. They know exactly exact number. And then, and then they take the the two three dollars per issue times 500, which is fifteen thousand fifteen hundred dollars. Yep. And then they're like, oh, let's buy 500 ad dollars worth of ad clicks in Detroit to Detroit people, saying that you can get. 50% off your Batman comics if you go to discount comic book service. You yeah. cannot tell me that has not happened at some place. And I refuse to give my money to my competitor. Right. To compete right. against me. Right. And and that's, I told DC, go fuck off. I made it very clear. And you know what? Jim Lee doesn't hold it against me. I just saw him like a month ago. And he knows, he knows hey, Dennis, how you doing? You know? <laughs> All right, stay tuned for part three with Wonder World Comics. This guy's a blast, man. A lot of fun, has a lot of knowledge. He's doing something totally different uh, out there and uh, got some great stories from some conventions to listen to, too. Okay, so as soon as one of uh, my videos on Tales from the Flip Side reaches 1,000 views, that's going to start triggering um, giveaways. And then so for every other uh, video that makes a thousand views. There'll be another giveaway when the first video makes 2,000 views That'll trigger a giveaway. So the number is a thousand. We're only 300 views away from the very first video that we put here on Tales from the flip side So here's what you got to do. You got to go back to the first uh, video and Hit the share button Right if you didn't like it hit the like button if you want to do uh, Didn't put in a comment put a comment in Something that's going to move us in the algorithm back up there so we can get to a thousand views so, so I can start giving away some really cool free comic books and probably some toys and some other jank stuff. We'll find. We'll uh, dig in the, you know, uh, some Scott Snyder signed stuff, some Sean Lewis signed stuff, uh, some Brian O'Halloran from Clerks 3 signed stuff. Maybe we'll give away. I got, a, I got a movie in the back. I'll get Brian to sign a movie. Listen, we're going to give away cool stuff, so stay tuned and keep watching.